So he looked at the careers of Bucky Fuller and Jean Prouvé uh, up through World War II. Uh, similar uh, interests in materials and fabrication and industry, uh, but a vastly different record of success uh, in applying uh, those principles to the actual market. Uh, Prouvé uh, would go on after World War II to a, a successful career, as would Fuller, as we'll see, but in very uh, different, different ways. Um, immediately after World War II, of course, much of France is devastated, uh, and there's a huge reconstruction project uh, to be done. Uh, Prouvé is contracted by the Ministry of Reconstruction to build something like 800 houses uh, as emergency shelters for French citizens who've uh, been left homeless by the, by the devastation. Um, because he is so knowledgeable about prefabrication, because he knows uh, how to make steel not only well but quickly, uh, these are all able to be built uh, in a single day by a team of four. So very much like Fuller's ideal for the Wichita house, the parts show up on a truck, four people put it together, there's an instant house uh, by the end of the day. It's important to note, Prouvé actually does this, right? This actually uh, works. It has the, the force of the French government behind it, uh, but Prouvé also has the, the kind of real world experience to know uh, what, it, what it takes to actually get these things out in, into the world. Um, he sets up a new factory in Maxéville, which is a suburb of his uh, hometown of uh, Nancy, uh, and he begins to get commissions for the French colonies in Africa. So houses that uh, will be manufactured uh, in France, put on a boat or a plane, uh, and set up uh, for uh, assumably French uh, citizens living, uh, living in Africa. Um, he works with Corbusier on an idea to build prefabricated apartment units for Corbusier's concrete uh, unité projects, uh, but this, this goes nowhere. And he begins to work not only in steel, but with also aluminum. And as we saw when we talked about the curtain wall, aluminum has this huge uh, revolutionary impact after World War II when it goes from being uh, a luxury material to really being a, an affordable commodity, uh, again because of the scaling up of the industry uh, around, uh, around military uses. So he uh, works with this uh, aluminum company, uh, Studal, and begins to sort of bristle a little bit at the uh, over-industrialization as he sees it. Um, he still believes in the atelier, he still believes in the factory floor, in the kind of industrial craft that he's grown up with. Um, and companies uh, like Studal, he believes, are, are kind of cheapening the process, right? That the, the uh, design value doesn't enter into it as much as uh, Prouvé would like. And not everything uh, is successful. We'll look at uh, a project briefly uh, that Prouvé has in 1949 to take the ideas from those Ministry of Reconstruction houses and to apply them on a countrywide scale. They get a little bit farther than the Wichita House project does, but, but not much. And Prouvé is at the same time very aware of all of the new technologies that come out of the aviation advances and more and more the aerospace advances that are happening uh, in metalwork. And he adapts his factory to these new processes. When we looked at the curtain wall, we looked at, for instance, the Alcoa building, which used stamped aluminum, rolled aluminum, cast aluminum in various uh, guises. And, and Prouvé is very on top of this in both aluminum and steel. And he develops his own uh, bespoke curtain wall products uh, that he uses not only on his own projects, but that he also licenses uh, and sells or installs as a, as a subcontractor. Um, Studal finally uh, uh, splits with Prouvé in 1954. Um, Corbusier tells him basically, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and, 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 uh, and, and try to re reinvent your career. Um, and he does, more as a designer than as an industrialist, though. He does projects for uh, schools that can be built again in the factory and shipped to the site, makes these cladding systems as well as uh, some more prefabricated housing and increasingly uh, pavilions. So to look at those very briefly, um, this is one of the emergency houses uh, that he does in 1940. 19, um, this is during the war. These end up getting built uh, after the war. And as you can see, they're built to a very, very strict module. So the factory can just churn out structural elements uh, over and over. Everything is sized to fit uh, into that module so that you can mix and match. You can kind of create your own uh, interiors. And you can see that they're fairly simple. They're certainly not as ambitious uh, as Fuller's Wichita houses, 
But again, these are houses that actually get deployed uh, in the in the in the post-war uh, era. And Prouvé takes what he learns from this and from his previous work uh, and comes up with a, a philosophy for his Maxéville uh, factory, um, which is basically that the designers are going to work with the people on the floor, the people who actually work with the, with the metal, and that they're going to work not necessarily in drawing, but much more in prototype and models. This is a, an approach that's more like today's industrial designers than architects. In other words, actually getting your hands dirty, getting on the floor and looking at how to do things better and better. And that is, as he says, whether it's a piece of furniture or a construction component or an entire building, um, that you're gonna work with the metal workers themselves as a designer to figure out um, how best to do it. You're gonna test that, you're gonna correct it, and only after you've built the prototype do you go in and actually start to do drawings. Evolution, he says, can only result from practical experience. So even though he is uh, French, you would think maybe there'd be a continental uh, influence. Um, as a, as a, a practitioner, he is definitely an empiricist, uh, almost a British empiricist uh, at that. Um, here he is on the right in the middle, uh, obviously late in the process because they're looking at drawings. On the left, scenes from the factory floor. And these should look familiar. This is exactly the sort of thing that Alcoa uh, is experimenting with in their building cladding experiments uh, for their own building. And Prouvé in this kind of um, uh, uh, manifesto of how he's gonna run his factory, um, describes architecture basically as an offshoot of industrial design, not as its own kind of separate uh, discipline. A building, he says, is just another object that needs to be constructed. It's just larger and has a greater market in the world waiting for it. Why not treat it as an item marketed by large industries? Um, channeling Bannum, he says, if the architect is not integrated into industry, industry will continue on without him. And this, he thinks, is a cause for concern because he says human factors must not be left out of account. This is a foreshadowing uh, of his split with the uh, uh, aluminum company. Um, a new type of architect must therefore be called into being who would be quite simply an industrialist. And why not? Such an architect, he says, head of industry will be listened to, followed, and not merely consulted. In other words, the idea almost kind of of the 19th century master builder uh, coming back. Um, the unsuccessful project to take the wartime housing and to turn it into mass-produced housing um, it produces one successful suburb uh, in Moudon, uh, uh, just outside of Paris in 1949. Um, these houses are still there. They're uh, well kept and <laughs> very desirable, as you can see. Um, but they take all of the processes that Prouvé has developed for the emergency housing and apply them more to middle class uh, dwellings. And if you look, you can see that Prouvé is using like every trick in the book, right? There are uh, sheet steel pieces, there are tubular pieces, there are bent steel plates. Um, all of these things are combined based on what Prouvé knows about what they can do for him. Uh, on the left, you see a typical interior that is Prouvé furniture designed to be affordable by the middle class. Now at you know, $900 or $1,000 a chair from, uh, from furniture companies. Note the ceiling, which is metal. There is timber uh, on the interior that gives uh, it some warmth, but the vast majority of, of the building is done in steel uh, and later in, in aluminum. And on the right, you see some of the cladding panels, sheet steel, but in between them, the framing that holds them up is bent steel. Again, Prouvé's preferred uh, uh, way of, of using this material. Um, here is one of the uh, uh, houses for uh, Al Al Algeria, the Maison Tropicale. You can see uh, the aircraft on the top kind of uh, spitting out the, the pieces that have been manufactured in France, flown to some remote location uh, in North Africa. And Prouvé is using, uh, again, this library of fabrication techniques, rolled steel, stamped steel, pressed sheet steel, folded steel, to create not only the building structure, not only the building cladding, um, but as you see on the bottom left, uh, shapes that respond to the climate. In the lecture on climate response, we looked briefly at a section of this house and talked about how the metal roof has a double skin uh, that was designed to move air, right? So as the, the air beneath the skin heats up, 
it gets exhausted through the ridge at the center and that pulls air through the, the living units below. Um, Prouvé again, he has one material that he uh, is comfortable with, metal, and here he uses it in every possible way he can, he can think of. And some of his later projects are, I, I think, some of his more impressive. The prefabricated schools, uh, some of which do get built, uh, emerge from this idea about what he calls the prop type, the uh, efficient double cantilever structure that you see in model form uh, and in prototype form in the, in the photos on the right. And he realizes that you can adjust the proportions of the cantilever to create uh, a very simple plan with a corridor and a schoolroom. The schoolroom opens up. Uh, to a glass and metal curtain wall that is uh, shaded and uh, in the back you can see on the north side uh, the, the the wall has more stone less glass uh, which is a, a again an appropriate climate response uh, for central and northern europe the cantilever is not a rolled shape you can see that uh, because it's tapering that is a built up uh, a piece of steel that uses flat plate for the web and then two more flat plates for what we would think of as the as the flanges but Prouvé also works in aluminum uh, with Studal and then later uh, on his own. And here is a, an example, an exhibition building from the early 1950s where um, he is using aluminum in a way that we don't often see it as a, as a long spanning uh, structure. Um, aluminum is more ductile, it's more flexible, therefore it doesn't quite have the, the rigidity that we like in our building structures. But for a long span, uh, Prouvé points out that it makes perfect sense, that, that you're not worried so much about deflection in the roof and that you get strength for weight uh, in aluminum that's slightly better than steel, uh, so why not? And on the right you see uh, an aluminum extrusion that is welded to a, a cast aluminum uh, pin joint. Uh, all of those are, are things that we don't often think about uh, in, in aluminum today, cast aluminum or welded aluminum. Extrusions are more normal, but here Prouvé again is thinking about all of the different uh, techniques, the sort of library of fabrication techniques uh, that he has at, at, at his disposal. And in his later career, he picks up on this idea of uh, curtain walls, both using uh, the, the folded steel that he was familiar with from his work in the 30s. You see a sketch there on the left where steel is being used both for the uh, elliptical form of the mullion that's taking the, the wind load, uh, but also for the pressure plate that's holding the glass in place, and then for the, um, the, 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 uh, the cladding pieces that you see on the exterior, the, what would be the um, louvers or sunshades, uh, those are held in place again by uh, folded steel pieces. On the right, this could be out of the Reynolds catalog, right? All of that can be done in a single extrusion, he realizes. And on the right, this is a post-war uh, cladding system that Prouvé develops, where again, you see with two pieces, extruded pieces, aluminum is able to give you both the, the kind of wind beam uh, off the back with what looks very much like a thick flange uh, at, the, at the bottom. Uh, it's able to shape itself around the neoprene gaskets that are gonna hold the glass in place. Uh, and it's able to create the pressure plate that you can screw on to the other mullion uh, that will keep a, a firm but distributed uh, grip on the, on the glass itself. And Prouvé is quite successful in this. Uh, as a curtain wall consultant, uh, he gets a lot of work in the 60s. Uh, and there are a number of buildings in Paris that have his custom designed curtain walls sort of plastered on them, right? Buildings by either uh, himself, uh, as you see on the far left, uh, or by other architects. This is the, the third UNESCO building uh, by Zerfus in Paris, done in 1968. And all of those pieces, as you see on the detail on the right, are done by uh, Prouvé. There's a, a steel beam at the back, and then there are uh, bent sheets uh, of, of aluminum that uh, are designed to grip the glass to hold it uh, in place. And Prouvé's own uh, um, construction uh, uh, business uh, continues uh, mostly with exhibition halls, long span spaces. Uh, for example, this one uh, in, uh, outside of Paris done in 1967. The cladding is clearly advanced uh, metalwork. The interior, you can see that he's experimenting with how you make prefabricated steel elements. There's a sort of tree in the middle that's bolted onto the deep girders. Uh, all of which can be fabricated in his factory, put on a truck, uh, and shipped to the site. 
And he has this great quote uh, in this era where someone asks him, you know, um, you do buildings, are you an architect or an, or an engineer? And he says, why ask you this question uh, or why argue about it? He says, building is what matters. It doesn't matter if you think of yourself as a designer or a constructor, uh, getting the building actually realized uh, is, is what's important. And then finally, just a couple of very late uh, projects uh, where he works with uh, architects basically as a, as a cladding designer. So architects figure out the layout of the building. Prouvé comes in and develops the curtain wall system uh, for it. This is a, a tower at La Défense, the, the big corporate um, district uh, to the northwest of downtown Paris. And you can see the cladding system going on, what would be a kind of normal uh, concrete slab construction. Prouvé does things like rounded corners that eliminate difficult uh, corner details, uh, but also has developed the, the mullions and the, the gripping system for the glass, uh, again, in, in, his, in his factories to maximize the efficiency uh, of the production. And increasingly toward the end of his career, uh, Prouvé uh, gets interested in, uh, in joining up with more radical architects and does things like competitions uh, on the right for the Ministry of Education. Prouvé will come back at the very end uh, of our lecture uh, in association with a competition, not that he designs, uh, but that he judges. So Prouvé goes from the kind of smallest possible scale of thinking about uh, fabricated metalwork to the absolute largest possible scale thinking about how this approach to technology can define uh, whole buildings and even, even on the, in the, the case of the structure on the right, uh, even whole urban precincts. And throughout, I think there is also some of the same balance that Fuller had in hiring Isamu Noguchi, thinking not only about uh, the efficiency, but you can see in this conflict he had with Studal, understanding that there is an aesthetic to the technology, that there are ways to express the fabrication techniques or the structure um, that are either more evocative, uh, more convincing, uh, or less. And to prove it clearly, it's worth investing the time and energy on the factory floor, maybe not necessarily behind a desk, to think about how best uh, to integrate those. In the last part of the lecture, we'll look at uh, our, the, the final uh, kind of uh, designer or, or pair of designers. Uh, who play around with these issues, who think of architecture, again, as more industrial design uh, than traditional architectural practice. And we will come back to Bucky Fuller uh, and talk about his career after the failure of the Wichita House and how these ideas really get transformed from industrial design to what Fuller might call world design.